What's up Westside? My name's Gianna and I'm so glad that you decided to log on here today and watch with us. Maybe it's your first time here or maybe you haven't clicked our connect link down below. If that is the case, then I need you to click that link. It's gonna say new. It's gonna bring you to a page that just lets you fill out all the information about you so we can get to know you, follow up with you, and of course, gift you a free Westside mug. Stay tuned for some announcements and the rest of the service. We hope you enjoy and we're so glad that you're here. Hey guys! How's it going? I'm Courtney. I'm the next gen director here at Westside, which means I get to lead kids, middle school, and high schoolers, which is really fun. Yes, yeah, so and my name is Gianna, and I am our administrative and communications lead. Nice. Yes, so fun. We have a couple announcements um, before we get started today. So if you see any Connect cards on your bench, it's probably like on one of the ends. If you are new to Westside or maybe you've been coming for a little bit, ah, oh, thank you, Peggy, and you want to get informed of what is going on, the Connect card is a really great way to do that. When you do fill that out, you also get a Westside mug, which you definitely want because then you can join our Westside mug shots which is always fun. And it's another good way to update any information that you have. So fill out a Connect card if you need to update your address, any information, or if you want a really cool mug. And next week, I hope you all would join us for our Easter service. Same time, same place. We're going to have AJ Swoboda here to lead our Easter service and just celebrate the resurrection of Jesus and be together on that day. And there's going to be a donut wall, so that's very fun too. So I know. Um, so as well as Easter, we have another um, event coming up for you. So on April 25th, it's going to be a Monday at 6.30 p.m. at the Loft. We're going to have our next step. So there's going to be pizza. And so we got, we got dinner served for you. But this is just a great way if, if you are feeling new-ish to Westside or maybe you're wanting to just explore more or learn what it means to be in a community group or learn uh, what it means to join a team, uh, we're going to have our leaders there, our, some of our council members, Courtney and I will be there just to kind of lead that way. So, again, if, if that is something that sounds good to you, please sign up. There is sign-ups in the back near the connection booth. You can sign up your name, who you're bringing, there's going to be child care, as well as you can head on the email or sign up online, all those ways to sign up. But let us know, you'll be there. Yes. Um, we also have a special opportunity tomorrow night. So as you may have noticed, we are in the middle of a pastoral transition. If that's news to any of you, you're going to hear a little bit more later. I know, surprise! Um, but one of the things is that, gosh, sometimes in the middle of transition, you kind of feel like you're stuck and that you don't know what to do. And I have an incredible ask of you because there is something that you guys can do, and that's pray. A couple months ago, I got to study the book of Acts, and in the book of Acts, every time that the believers gathered together and they broke bread and they prayed, the Lord moved. The Holy Spirit showed up right after. So tomorrow at 7 o'clock, we're going to gather at the loft so that we can pray in hopes that the Spirit is going to move in our church through this transition, through a new pastor, through a new leader. So I'm inviting all of you personally to come to the loft. That's our building on Congress Street and pray with us seven o'clock and we'll have coffee. Beautiful. Yep. And then I sound like a broken record every time I say it, but I love saying thank you for faithfully giving. Your generosity doesn't go unnoticed and we just want you to know how thankful we are and um, you really are um, such a big part of Westside. And I always say you don't, you're not just giving to Westside, you're giving through Westside. So there's so many more things just out of our Westside bubble that this is going to. So thank you for um, being faithful in that. And um, there's different ways you can do that. You can do the text to give option. You can go online, you can go in the back. Um, and those are just some ways to do that. So again, if you wanna continue to do that, great, or start doing that. And there's the um, little picture on the screen so you can see just how to. So again, thank you for that. And yeah, that's all the announcements we got for you. We have a special guest with us. Uh, David Eddy, he's our associate district supervisor. He's going to be coming up and sharing with us. And yeah, so give him a warm welcome. <laughs> hey, everybody. Oh, I love it. It's so good to be with you tonight. Uh, I'm just going to tell you a couple things right off the bat. Uh, this is not going to be a regular um, Palm Sunday message. So I'm just going to throw that out to you. 
um, number one. Number two, um, I'm, I, I, I do get to serve as associate district supervisor. I am not here to make an announcement of a new pastor. That's not what I'm here to do. I'm here to talk to you a little bit about transitions, and I'm really excited to be able to do that. And we're going to jump into the word. By the way, we're going to be in the book of Joshua tonight, Joshua chapter three. So that's going to come up on the jumbotrons eventually here. And um, I don't know what you call them here. I always called them the jumbotrons. So I don't know. That's not whatever. So before I, I, I have the opportunity and the privilege of serving in the Northwest District as one of our associate district supervisors. I live up in Beaverton. Um, before that, my wife, her name is Sunshine, and that is her real name. And uh, she's a phenomenal leader, uh, amazing communicator. She's, she's awesome. If you meet my wife after that, I will always be Sunshine's husband. And I'm cool with that. That's totally fine. And uh, before we, we stepped into, I stepped into this role, she stepped into an area pastor role up around the Beaverton, Portland area. We pastored in LaGrande, Oregon for 17 years. Do you know where LaGrande is? Anybody know where LaGrande, Oregon is? Okay, that's pretty good. So just for the record, and I say this at every church I go to, that's actually Eastern Oregon. So Bend, even though it's east of here, is not Eastern Oregon. I mean, there's not a lot of people between Bend and Idaho. There's a lot of state, but there's still people further east, okay? So I'm excited that somebody knows where that is because you were on your way somewhere. Most people was like, I was on my way too, and I went through LaGrande, Oregon. So I actually grew up out there in a little town of 295 people, Imbler, Oregon, and then I moved to Los Angeles, um, and <laughs> it was awesome. Um, I remember it was great. So, and now we live up at Beaverton. We get to serve uh, in the Northwest District. My role is I handle all of the transitions in the Northwest District and church and pastoral health. So once our supervisor, Dave Edler, stands up and tells people what I do, I, I seem like, I feel like if I call our pastors, they're going to see my name come up and go, I don't want to talk to him. He's going to either talk about health or transitions, right? But transitions are one of the things that I get to work with, and I love uh, the opportunity to serve our pastors and our churches in that way. Uh, you're part of the Northwest District, which, if you didn't know, is Alaska, Washington, Oregon, Idaho, Montana, Wyoming, and North Dakota. And we only have a few transitions going on, and there's just a little bit of space in our district. So it's, it's really an exciting time in our district. God's doing good things. And, and I'm here. I want to talk tonight about the incredible things that God wants to do in and through this church, but also in our own lives through transitions. Because here's the thing, I've got all sorts of stuff I'm going to share in here, but I'm really simple about this, right? Your pastors heard from the Lord that their season here was done, right? So that can't just be about them. Transitions are never just about the pastors that are leaving or the pastors that are coming in. Change is never that way. Whenever there's change, if God is working and doing that, that also has to be about us. There has to be something that God's going to do in us too, because transitions are way bigger than just one person. And so we get the opportunity in the midst of it to say, okay, Lord, well, what are you, what are you doing? What do you want to do? What are you going to do in me? What are you doing here? How are we going to navigate this? I love that they said tomorrow night there's a time of prayer because I just want to encourage you that we want to be people that are praying. We're praying for you along with you as you're praying about, Lord, who's, who's the next pastor? Who's the called person of God, as we say, to lead this church into its preferred future? Who is that person out there? And we know that God has that. So tonight I want to talk to you about um, Adam Joshua. Uh, the, I titled this Vantage Point. And the reason why is, is because what I'm going to read to you, this scripture, and I'm going to read a little chunk of scripture here, and then we'll just make a few comments, is really a vantage point of like transition, kind of where we are in the life of this church. Right? This is a beautiful vantage point to see a lot of things that God would have it do. Now, a couple of reminders here. Joshua chapter 3. If you go back and you read earlier chapters, and, and I encourage you, you heard it here, go read the Bible. All right, so go do that. If you go back a couple of chapters and you read, you're going to see there's the sending out of the spies, the surveying of the land. They know that they're going to, there's Jericho. They, there's a lot of things that are going on. But what picks up in Joshua chapter 3 is where the Lord is speaking to Joshua and the Israelites about crossing the Jordan River into the promised land. This is the second time. This is after they've come the first time and they've been in the desert 40 years and now they're about ready to cross into this promised land and see this, the, the, the promises of God. So I want to read chapter 3 in Joshua. I'm going to read the whole thing. It's a short chapter. Um, and this is what it says. It says this, early in the morning Joshua and all the Israelites set out from Shittim and went to the Jordan where they camped before crossing over. 
After three days, the officers went throughout the camp, giving orders to the people. When you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God and the Levitical priests carrying it, you're to move out from your positions and follow it. Then you will know which way to go since you've never been this way before. But keep a distance of about 2,000 cubits between you and the ark and don't go near it. Joshua told the people, consecrate yourselves for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. Joshua said to the priests, take up the ark of the covenant and pass on ahead of the people. So they took it up and went ahead of them. And the Lord said to Joshua, today I will begin to exalt you in the eyes of all Israel so they may know that I am with you as I was with Moses. Tell the priests who carry the Ark of the Covenant, when you reach the edge of the Jordan's waters, go and stand in the river. Joshua said to the Israelites, come here and listen to the word of the Lord your God. This is how you will know that the living God is among you and that he will certainly drive out before you the Canaanites, Hittites, Hivites, Perizzites, Girgashites, Amorites, and Jebusites. See, the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of all the earth will go into the Jordan ahead of you. Now then, choose 12 men from the tribes of Israel, one from each tribe. And as soon as the priests who carry the Ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, set foot in the Jordan, its waters flowing downstream will be cut off and stand up in a heap. So when the people broke camp to cross the Jordan, the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant went ahead of them. Now the Jordan is at flood stage all during harvest. Yet as soon as the priests who carried the Ark reached the Jordan and their feet touched the water's edge, the water from the upstream stopped flowing, piled up in a heap a great distance away at a town called Adam in the vicinity of Zarethan. While the water flowing down to the Sea of the Arabah, that's the Dead Sea, was completely cut off. So the people crossed over opposite Jericho. The priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stopped in the middle of the Jordan and stood on dry ground while all Israel passed by until the whole nation had completely crossed over. I love this scripture. I, this is a picture in some incredible ways about transition and where, where we are sometimes as individuals, as churches, and about transitions in our lives. The first thing after all of this that the Lord says to the Israelites when they get to the edge of the Jordan River is this, follow me. After all of the years of doing that, he just reminds him after all the years in the desert and sending out the spies and seeing the land and all of those things, he simply tells them, listen, when I move, follow me because I'm, gonna, I'm going to lead you in the right way that you should go. I love verse four. He even tells them, by the way, you don't know this way before. You're kind of off the map here. This is a new way. I'm going to lead you someplace you haven't been before. So you can't plot your course. You just need to follow where I'm going to lead you. I always found this was really interesting because literally, if you go back and read it for the last 40 years, that's what they've been doing is following where God would lead. And they were probably getting pretty familiar with the things and the places they'd been and where they had come and how to get around. And now they were being led into a new land with a new direction. I think what's interesting about life, and I'm kind of simplistic about some of that is, following where God's lead is really what life is about at so many levels. How many of you know that if you try to lead God, that never works out well? Right. I'm just I mean, I, I can tell you right now and we'll confess in front of you that in the last 27 years of ministry, I have tried on all three roles of Father, Son and Holy Spirit. And I'm awful at all three roles. Like I'm terrible. And so are you. I mean, not that you're terrible people, but you would be terrible in that role. Because God is the one who leads and then we get to do this beautiful following of where he goes. And I love this because this is what God's saying. I love to the Israelites. I've been faithful and I've asked you to follow me. We're going into something new. What do I want you to do? Follow me. How many of you here like, you just, you thrive on change. Any, any of those people that are like, I love change. Yeah, that's few. Usually there's always somebody who raises their hand and like, I love change. And I'm like, do you? Or do you like love it when you change those people over there? Like we love change hypothetically. I mean, you know, but change can be hard. I would say the last two years have brought on some change. Like whether we've liked it or not. And we've, we've, had, to, we've had, to, we had to flex some change muscle in our life. And change is not easy. And yet when we're changing from what was and we're in this transitional season, because that's what we're in is this space between when your pastors have left and then who's coming in this space right here. This is a sacred, this is a sacred space, a holy space. And in that space where there is change and sometimes there's question marks of the unknown, what do we do? Follow, follow where God leads in your own life. Press in, don't step back. Because he's going to continue to lead this church as he always has. 
So again, I told you I grew up in Eastern Oregon out on the hinterlands, the far northeast corner of the state, but not in the sagebrush. It was up in the mountains. Legrand's beautiful for the record. All right. So growing up out there, we hiked, we hunted, we did all of that stuff. And my dad, my, he loved to hunt and hike and fish and everything else under the sun. And that's what I grew up doing because that's what you do when you live in Eastern Oregon. And uh, we had all sorts of crazy things out there. Like you call any vehicle that you have is a rig. So we used to use the term rig. And some, I'm looking around, some people are like, I don't even know what that is. Do you want to know something really interesting about Eastern Oregon? What do you guys call on the passenger side, the thing that you open up that you put stuff in? What's that called? There you go. It's a glove compartment in the rest of the world, but in Eastern Oregon and in Western Idaho, it's called a jockey box. Don't ask me why, we're, we're broken. <laughs> we're broken people. So we come up with words like that, right? So growing up out there, we would go with my dad and he would like cover territory. And my brother and I, there were five of us in the family, but my, my nearest oldest brother and I, I was the baby. I was the youngest one. I was the special one. Um, we, would, we would go out with my dad and we would fight to see who could get closest to behind him because we could hook our finger through his belt loop. Because we figured that like, you know, and it was true, like you kind of hook your finger through his belt loop and it was like, you know, you just get pulled along. But we would like push each other to see, we, you didn't figure that we, there were more than one belt loop. It didn't matter, we were brothers. So we would try to get our finger in that belt loop. Now, the crazy thing about that was the vantage point from that position was you didn't see a whole lot of what was going on around you. You just saw the back, all I saw was the back of my dad. But here's the crazy thing. When I had my finger hooked into his belt loop and I saw the back of my dad, I never worried about where I was, never worried about how I was gonna get where I was gonna go. I always knew we would get where we were gonna go. We were never lost, we were just exploring, right? Yeah, but there were beautiful moments like that. When I think about what the Lord says to the Israelites as they're getting ready to crawl, cr cross into the promised land, it's beautiful, he's like, just. I've been faithful and you followed me. We're gonna to go to a new place that you don't know that you've never been before. And I'm just gonna simply ask you to follow me. Hook a finger in the belt loop and let's go. Cause we're gonna watch where he's gonna lead. He's gonna be faithful and it's good. By the way too, verse five, Joshua tells the people, consecrate yourselves for tomorrow. The Lord will do amazing things among you. I will tell you right now, the best seat in the house is following God. Not leading him, not running out in front, but as we follow where the Lord leads, that's a beautiful picture, some, some miraculous things. I don't know what it looks like to have water pile up. That's gotta be pretty awesome. But I'm gonna tell you right now, as they followed, that was the front row seat, some powerful and amazing encounters. So as we are people in the midst of a transitional season, where we're in this space here, this is where God's gonna continue to do it. It's, it's, I'm gonna tell you, it's not profound and yet it is. We need to follow where he leads. Let's listen for where God's gonna say, continue just to follow me because he has been faithful. He will continue to be faithful. So I wanna go on, I, I read chapter three. I wanna read the first seven verses of chapter four because it's really important. This is what it says in, in chapter four of Joshua. It says this, so when the whole nation had finished crossing the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, choose 12 men from among the people, one from each tribe, and tell them to take up 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan, from right where the priests are standing, and carry them over with you and put them down on the place where you stay tonight. So Joshua called together the 12 men he had appointed from the Israelites, one from each tribe, and said to them, go over before the ark of the Lord your God in the middle of the Jordan. Each of you is to take up a stone on his shoulder, according to the number of the tribes of the Israelites, to serve as a sign among you. In the future, when your children ask you, what do these stones mean? Tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. When it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. These stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. I love the fact that, you know, here we are, that they're crossing over and the Lord asks in this section of scripture to, to set up a memorial. This section of scripture is a beautiful picture of a transition and, a, and change in my mind. So we just read this, the Israelites are gonna cross. They've been instructed that these 12 men that represent each tribe of Israel are gonna pick up a rock. They're gonna put it on their shoulder and they're gonna set up this pile of 12 stones. And he asks them to do that so that every time they come back to that place, when they lead their children across there, when they bring them back and they see that pile of stones, from there they would be able to say, this is a reminder. This is a reminder of where God led us across the Jordan, right? That's what he's telling them. 
Everyone is working together on this. One person from each tribe is setting up a memorial where everybody coming back through would be able to remember and be reminded of God's faithfulness and his power. Now, here's the crazy thing about it. I was thinking about this. You set up the pile of stones. Not only is it a reminder, but that's the vantage point. From that pile of stones, if you had been part of that, one of the Israelites, and you came back to the pile of stones, from that position, you would be able to look back across the Jordan River from where you came. You'd be able to see the land that you had been in. You'd be able to see the river and you'd be able to see the place where God met you in faithfulness and the waters dried up. And then you'd also be able to look the other direction and see forward into the land that God was leading you into. That would be the vantage point where you would be able to look back and look forward at the same time. And it's really important to have a clear vantage point. We need clear vantage points. We need those spaces to look back and we need the spaces to look forward. You know, Westside, this is where, this is the place where you are right now as a church. Is standing at a vantage point in a transitional moment where, we're, where it's a pastoral transition and some of you may have been through those before. Some of you may not have been through those. And so I don't know what this means, but this is that space where we are. And transition gives us that view, a look back to see where we've been and a look forward to see where we're going. And it's a good vantage point and it's healthy and it can be really important. But I'm gonna, I'll say this about vantage points. It's important how we look back, all right? You know, you ever, you ever look back and reminisce? You ever get, if you have siblings, the older you get and you, I don't know if you've ever done this. The older I get and when I'm with my siblings and we talk about our past, I'm like, whose house did you live in? <laughs> like, I don't even know the story you're telling because I was there and that's how that happened. And it was so weird to have three siblings and all different perspectives. It's weird. It's like, wait, no, that's not what you said this. And it was like so long ago, no one remembers. I just, I'm, so I know as the youngest child of five, I was probably instigator. It was probably just the given. I was the one doing that, but everybody else got blamed. How we look back is important. And here's the reason why. If you look back over where you've been and you only see the good, everything was good back there, then you won't move into the future because nothing will ever be as good in front of you as it was behind you. We'll always compare, like it was, nothing will ever be as good as this. If you look back and all you see is the bad, you'll never move forward into something new because you're fearful of like, that was really hard and I don't wanna go back there. So I think I'm just gonna stay right where I am because I, I don't wanna move forward. But if from that vantage point, you look back and you go, hey, I see the good and the bad, but what I really see is God's faithfulness in the midst of all of it. I see that he's been faithful through everything the good, the bad, I mean, the last two years, the things that we've all dealt with, all of those things that God has been faithful. Then from that vantage point, when you look forward, you go, well, what, can, what is my expectation for the future? My expectation for the future is exactly what I've seen in the past. God has been perfectly faithful then. He's perfectly faithful now, and he'll be perfectly faithful in the future. Leading this church forward as he always has, right? This space, here that we're in right now. This, uh, I don't have a really fancy title for it, so I call it the middle time, right? This is the middle time. Pastors leave, we're praying, seeking the Lord. God, who do you have? Who's the called person of God to lead this church next? What does that look like? This is, and I use this term and I don't use it lightly, this is a sacred space. This is a space where God is doing incredible work in us and in the lives of a church. And it is a, it is a holy, sacred space. There are things that will come up in our lives in these moments that don't come up any, anywhere else. So how many of you guys, you guys know the name? I know that many, some of you know the name, Gabe Barrero. You guys know Gabe? Okay. So Gabe, Nicole, good friends, love them dearly. When I first came into this role, it was as an associate supervisor with Gabe as our, as our district supervisor in what was the North Pacific District. And we were talking about transitions and I asked him the question one day, I said, hey Gabe, I go, you ever get night crawlers to go fishing? <laughs> well, I grew up in Eastern Oregon. Gabe grew up in LA. His response to me was, no, I have never picked up worms. I was like, okay, cool. 
I get that. I said, well, listen, growing up as a kid, there were two ways that we would get worms. One, we would put a sprinkler on the yard all day long and then go out at night with a flashlight and the worms are laying out on the ground and you pick them up. Good fun in Eastern Oregon in a town of 295 people. There wasn't a lot else to do. So we go out and pick up worms. I said, the other way we would do it is my dad made this contraption that was two handles with long metal spikes that you shoved into the ground and there was an electrical cord frayed and attached to the metal. Then you plugged it in. Things got real uncomfortable down there and man, the worms would come up. And I remember this conversation because he was like, There's, is there a point to this? And I was like, there is. I go, that's transition. And he's like, I go, sometimes things get uncomfortable and stuff comes to the surface in our lives that will never come up at any other space. And you're like, wow, that's, you really took a long time to get to that point. But here's the thing about it is, is that's what I'm talking about. When we talk about looking back and seeing the faithfulness of God and looking forward, and then we're in the middle of this space, what do we do? We continue to follow, we continue to press in, and we let God speak to us about the things in our own hearts and lives. Listen, I've determined, whether you like change or not, I have determined in my life, I am not going to waste change. If I'm going to be in the middle of a space where there is change going on, then I, I'm going to ask the question, Lord, if there's something you want to change in me, then change it. Because we're changing and it can't just be about outside of me. It has to also, is there anything within me that you want to change? Right? Because this is that space. This is a space where God does that work in us, preparing us for what? For the kingdom ministry that he has for us now and moving into the future. Right? So the season that we're in will have question marks. What's next? How long does this go? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer a couple of those and then we're going to wrap this up. Here's a couple of things. How long does a transition last? I don't know. What's the average? Every transition is different, just like every church is different, right? How long does it take to find another pastor? It, every church is different. Every transition is different. There's not an average time. I love it when I say that because I'll still have people come up and go, okay, yeah, I know that, but give me an average time. I don't have an average time. Because we're not looking for the next available person. We're looking for the called person of God. Right? How many of you, you want the next pastor to know that God's called them to be here to serve? Right? Okay. Good. Because in Foursquare, we don't do it like the DMV. It's not like we give out numbers and then we're like, hey, number 68, you know, you're up. And the next church that's open, we just put someone in there. There is a discerning, a communal discerning process that we enter in because we are looking for that called person. Right? So that's the season that we're in right now. We're in this middle space. Jesus, what are you doing? Lord, if there's things you want to do in me, do them in me. Outside of here, I am working and praying and seeking the Lord, our district supervisor, our team. We're working with your church council. Now in transitions, I primarily work with the church council. The reason why that is, is church council members are ratified from the membership of a four square church. So they're the ones that we connect with. And the, here's the thing about it. We don't bring, like, I don't, I don't usually... Not usually. I don't come to councils and say, here's like 14 resumes, choose one. What will happen is, as we move down the road, if we identify somebody that I'm like, I think they're the one, and I talk with our supervisor, and we, we talk to them, and they begin to pray, and they're like, I think that's where God's calling us. Then what we do is we come back to the church council and say, I think we may have found the called person of God. Then we set up a meet and greet. What that is, is a real fancy term from Eastern Oregon. Um, to, uh, uh, we have food together. We eat and we bring like the couple in with the council and we spend time together. We said, okay, you guys, now we're asking you as council members to go pray. Take a few days to pray. Do you confirm this? Because we're bringing somebody we think has that call in their life. And do you confirm that as well? So it is a communal discerned process that we walk through. What, again, time frame. Here's what I always tell people. Imagine it this way, and I'm not saying this is here. But if we do, let's say we find the called person of God, but let's say they live a long ways away and they have to sell a house or they're already involved in the life of another church. There sometimes is a transitional process for them to extricate themselves from that life and to come here. So the time frame can be different. Here's what I can tell you in the middle. In the middle of this, you're not alone. You have an amazing team. There's people that are going to be bringing the word of God, stay connected, keep pressing in, and we're going to keep walking this out together. You might even have to see my face again. I'm sorry for that. But, um, you know, it's like, oh, that's, it's him again. Oh, great, great. But I know this church, I'm excited for what God has. I'm so thankful for your pastors, Brooks, Chris. You guys, they're some of my favorite people on the entire planet. And um, I, in fact, I was texting with Brooks today saying, yeah, I'm going to, you know, be, be at the church tonight. And we're just texting back and forth. And I just love him. 
love how they led, love their ministry. And I also know, I'm super thankful for leaders that know when they hear Jesus that their time is done and they move on to what God has for them next. So I'm really, this season, I, I, I'm, I, wanna, I just want to continue to reiterate that we're going to be here. We're going to walk this out and continue to pray with you. I do want to do this tonight. Just Now, some of you may know this, but that's okay. I want our council members to come up here because I want the council members just to introduce themselves really quick. And um, are, are, do we have council members? I know. Come on up here, council members. Stop. with the, Don't be shy. Come on. This is like a potluck. Everybody's like, wait for one person to go first. And then it's legal. So um, can I use this microphone? Is that okay? Oh, you have one. Okay, great. Whew. I'm just going to ask him to introduce me because we don't assume. We were talking about this beforehand. Sometimes people are like, oh, I know who our church council members are. And some people are like, we have a church council? And that's fine. But these are the people, these are leaders that God has called, that they've said yes, that in this season are serving as a church council. I thought it would be really good that you guys just get a chance to see them and have them introduce themselves really quick. And then um, I'm going to wrap this up. So go ahead. Okay, I think I have, yep, mic's on. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Chris Russmuggle. Um, I've been, uh, my husband and I have been coming to this church about uh, 12 years, and um, I've been on the council less than a year. I was on it um, during the transition um, when Brooks came on, so i um, really excited to see what God has uh, next for us, and I'm just, we're just going to pass the mic down, and everybody's going to introduce themselves, and that way you can just, like, we're here, we're available, um, you know, if, if you have any questions or you just need guidance, just where are you can come talk to, so. Hi, I'm Shannon McCallan. My husband and I, uh, John, my husband John, I've been going to Westside also about 12 years. Um, I've been on the council once before, so I'm just now returning. And um, yeah, we're looking forward to see what God does. Hi, I'm Steve Harris. Um, me and my wife have been coming here a year and a couple months since North Eugene joined, and I've been on the council, and I'm here if you need anything. I'm Sarah Creighton. My family and I have been here about seven years, and I have lost track of how long I've been on the church council, but I think my time's almost up. <laughs> No. I have Trevor Campbell, uh, my wife Anna's over there, and then we have two young boys, uh, 10 and 8, in Kids Church, and we've been here at Westside for about 10 years. Hi, I'm Dan Hughes. Uh, my wife and I, Tamara, have been uh, going here with our son Mason for about five or six years. Uh, fun fact, I'm Trevor and Kyle's neighbor. That's a great neighborhood. <laughs> uh, and uh, happy to help if you have any questions or any way we can help. Hi, I'm Kyle Anderson, known as Angie's husband. Uh, she's awesome. <clears throat> I've been on the council too long, uh, on and off, and uh, I've, I've actually gone through both transitions, and God has someone for us. It's going to be awesome, and so hang in there. It's going to be great. If you have any questions, I know all of us will be very happy to answer anything we can. Thank you. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Yeah, you can clap. I think it's great. I love it. I've had a chance to meet with your council, amazing leaders. And I love that they're saying, hey, we're here and available. So if there are questions, ask council members, your team here. It, this is one of those things that we're going to, you could you press in together as a family. So here's what I'm going to ask you to do something that's not necessarily easy, but it is so good. I'm going to ask you to lean into the question marks. Lean into the space where you don't have the answers. Listen, one of the things I've realized the longer I walk with Jesus is I am really faithful as long as I knew everything that's coming. You realize that? Like sometimes like I just am the most faithful person if I could just know everything is coming. But, but then sometimes that doesn't require faith. So in the midst of the unknown, let's step close to Jesus. Draw close to him so that we can hear what he's doing. Because if you look at the Old Testament, there's some beautiful pictures of transitions. We just talked about this one. We like sometimes the ones that are the Red Sea, right? So the enemy is pursuing. God comes between it. The wind blows all night. The sun comes up. The Red Sea's parted. They see here. They see where they're going. They're going. And then the one we just talked about, which was, okay, I'm going to lead you someplace you haven't been before. And before we go, I'm, you're going to have to step in the water first. And the, but he is faithful because they've watched him be faithful, just like this church knows and has experienced the faithfulness of God. I'm learning that these transition seasons, again, are profound times of waiting on the Lord, hearing, listening, and growing. We get to respond to him. In fact, listen, I'm going to invite our worship team to come back up and they're going to lead us tonight in a closing song. Um, 
And as we're worshiping this last song, here's, here's what we're going to do. There's going to be people available for prayer. It may be nothing even associated with the things I've been talking about. Or maybe it will be. It may be something as simple as saying, hey, listen, I need prayer tonight because it changes hard for me and actually is, is super difficult, but I just need you to pray with me for this season. You're welcome to do that. Maybe transition brings up the, some things that, you know, that you're like, I just, I just want to, I want to bring this before the Lord. And there may be completely unrelated things, but there'll be people available to pray for you tonight. So I just encourage you to do that. But let's continue. We're going to be people. We're going to follow where the Lord's leads. We're going to press in. Don't pull back. Give room for what God wants to speak in this season. I love as your council member said this, we know God has the called person on God. Let's wait and hear what he's going to say as he leads us. He is this church so thankful to be with you tonight, um, just to be here to worship and share a couple of things. But our team in the Northwest District, we talk about you, all, all good things, all good things. Um, we're interceding for you, walking this out with you. Please know we're available to you as well. Father, just open our hearts tonight as we worship you in this place, as we, as we just... Seal this time in your presence and worship. Continue to speak to us. Continue to lead us and guide us in these moments. Thank you, Jesus, that you are the Lord of this church. You are the Lord of the church. And Lord, I pray that this would be an incredible season of blessing and peace that you pour out in the midst of Westside as we walk through this season of transition. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much again for logging on and being here with us. We hope you enjoyed and we hope you have a great rest of your week.